Thank you so much for coming to my talk today. This talk is on internal library dependency management, and my name is Kelly Schuster. So hopefully you're in the right spot. But if you're not, you should stick around anyway, because it's going to be fun. So I work at ThoughtBot, and we are a mobile and web design and development shop. And I work in our office in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I am an Android developer there. I'm also a Google developer expert for Android. And I am also the director for Women Who Code Denver. We host technical talks and coding workshops for women in our community. All right, so I'm just going to jump right in and talk about private library dependency management. And I'm going to tell you a little backstory on why I care about this. So a few years ago, I was introduced to the Ruby programming language. And they do their dependency management through a file called a gem file. So they're really cutesy, so all of their libraries are called gems. Um, and the gem file allows a really powerful management system where you can specify, I want to use this branch. And if this branch doesn't, use, doesn't exist, just pull from master. And if master doesn't exist, just pull from this you know, hosted library site. And you can specify all of this in just one line. This seemed like an incredible thing to me. And I really wanted to have this kind of powerful, beautiful uh, dependency management tool for Android. So I decided to go on a quest to find it, because I knew that Android could, could probably do this. Unfortunately, it's been kind of more of an epic quest than I originally imagined. I have not found the silver bullet slash gem file-esque solution. However, I have come across a lot of different solutions, and they all have some really decent pros and cons. So today, I'm going to walk through four main solutions and uh, share with you the pros and cons of each. That way, you can take this back to your job and your team and decide which one works the best for you. So a little bit of terminology. So I have source code that I will share with you at the end of this talk posted on my GitHub. And I have two repos that I'm going to be referencing. One is called dependency sample, and one is called the dependency sample lib. So I'm also going to use the terminology for the dependency sample as the shell repo, because I like to think of this as the veneer. This is like the outer cover, your UX and UI and stuff like that. Um, and then the library I'll just refer to as the library, because this is your library. So the two main solutions, or the main groups of my solutions fall into is there's one that's Git-based, and there's one that's Maven-based. So Git-based solutions will allow you to have access to your source code, and Maven-based solutions will give you a pre-compiled JAR or AAR file. So there's sort of like two different camps. Then I will be talking about two different genres within these camps. So in Git, I will talk about Git submodules and Google's repo tool. And for the Maven solutions, I'll be talking about Artifactory and Jitpack. All right, so we're off. Here we go, Git submodules. So here is a visual representation of what Git submodules is doing. So I've got the dependency sample box, which is signifying my repository, my Git repository. And then inside that, I have app, which is a module. So you know, when you start up a Hello World project in Android Studio, they create the app module. That's what that is. Then my other repository is dependency sample lib, and I've got the my library module in there. And then what Git submodules is doing is using Git, it allows your app module to point directly to your my library module. And it does this by referencing a specific Git commit SHA. So it doesn't know about branches, it doesn't know about what's the latest version on master, it's just pointing to a specific commit number. So I like to think of this the same way I think about pointers in C is you're not pointing to like a value, you're pointing to a, a memory location. So I think your first red flag should be, if this person is using C pointers as a way to make understanding something easier, there's probably a, an issue here. <laughs> and it is. So submodules are a little bit complicated. So when you pull a project down that's using Git submodules, that's what it's looked like in Android Studio. So you've got your app code up at the top there. And then super easy, you've got your dependency library code in there as well. So it's nice that everything is in one Android Studio project after you pull it down. The branch that I am going to be using in my uh, source code that I'm sharing uh, for this example is O2 Git Submodules branch. So you can take a look at that later. All right, so first things first, how do we even set this up? So when you're sitting at the top level directory of your uh, shell repo, 
you'll run this command, git submodule add, and then the full URL to the git repository for your library. Here's a visual representation of what's that doing. So we are sitting in the dependency sample uh, shell branch. We run this command, ta-da! Now we have our pointer off to the commit SHA, 78C7 blah blah blah. So remember this is just pointing to a specific commit value. And this is what our directory structure looks like after we run that. We've got uh, a file called .git modules, and then we have an empty folder named dependency sample library that hasn't been filled up with code yet, but it's waiting to get that code. So if we take a look inside our .git modules file, we can see that we have uh, up here the submodule name, um, and then the path where our submodule is going to get stored, and then the URL. So I keep on saying that we're referencing a specific commit, but one thing you'll notice here is that the git modules file, even though it's sort of like the manifest of all your submodules, it actually does not include the commit number. You have to know what commit you're referencing by running a command, which I'll show you later on. But that's one thing that's a little bit confusing. All right, so git has been set up to tie these two repos together, but like our Android project doesn't know how to build it correctly. So of course we'll have to add our Gradle references. So in your repo level settings.gradle, you will include dependency sample library colon my library. So if you're not familiar with uh, Groovy or Gradle, um, actually the file delimiters, the slashes, are actually just colons. So this is basically just defining a directory file path. And then in our app module build.gradle file, we'll also say compile project and then the name of our project. So one thing you'll do a lot when you're using submodules is check the submodule status. All you have to do is just run git submodule at your shell directory level, and it'll print out everything you care about for all of your submodules. So we only have one. So here I run git submodule. It prints out this massive commit SHA. That's a full commit SHA. And it also says the name of the repo that it is referencing. All right, so someone else has set up some submodules. So how do you actually get code? Because, of course, it's not straightforward. So if you're pulling down the code for the first time, you'll run git clone the name of your shell repo, and dash dash recursive. And what dash dash recursive does for you is it essentially um, initiates these two commands, git submodule init and git submodule update after you've cloned. So that's just sort of a sort, uh, shortcut. If you are checking out a new branch, you will actually have to run git submodule init and git submodule update on your own. There's no such thing as git checkout branch name dash dash recursive. So, uh, make sure that you remember to do that. So we'll just kind of do a quick one, run through of these commands. A git checkout branch name, so git checkout 02 submodules. And then you can see that once I've done that, I've got my git modules, doc git modules file and my dependency sample library. But if I cd into dependency sample library, we can see that it's empty. So checking it out wasn't enough. We run git submodule init, which initializes a lot of things in hidden folders that we don't really care about right now, but we have to do. Uh, and then git submodule update is where the magic actually finally happens. So I run git submodule update, and at the end of my update command, I can see, ta-da, we have checked out our library at FF07, which is awesome. All right, so you've been working on some code with a friend, and she's made some changes, so you want to pull those down. So how do you do that with git submodules? So, of course, you can't just do a git pull. You also have to then later run git submodule update. If you yourself are working and want to make changes to this library, how do you do it? So, just as sort of like a level set, in this scenario, um, I run git status so that I can see that I am currently at FF07. And again, just a reminder, the visual representation of this is that we've got our branch, our shell branch, and it is pointing to the specific commit, FF07. So the first thing I want to do if I want to make changes to the library is I have to check out a branch for my library repository. So first here I'm saying, okay, git branch 02 git submodules dash A, just to have a new branch. And then you can see at the bottom here, I git branch, I've confirmed that I am currently, um, I've checked out the branch, and I'm currently on the, the new branch. So notice I went from uh, git branch command saying that I'm detached on FF07 to now I'm officially on a branch. 
So we can see here this visual representation that the, nothing has changed like from the, the, um, the type of code that dependency sample is referencing. It's still referencing FF07, but the way that Git is thinking about it is now different. Instead of being a random commit, FF07 is now part of a branch. So we can safely make changes. So the number one reason that people don't like submodules is because they commit on a detached head. And yes, that is actually as scary as it sounds. So I'm going to show you how it happens and what you can do to fix that. So as a level set, we can see here that I am currently, I ran get status, I'm at, uh, on a detached head at 1BD7, uh, right there. And I've made some changes to my build.gradle file. So instead of checking out a branch like I'm supposed to, um, I just decide to run git commit. So we can see here I am in this commit that's hanging out there. I run git commit new Gradle comments, and git is really helpful to me, and it says, yay, now this is a detached head at 177. So I'm like, sweet, I made that change. I'm good to go. Wrong. I run git status, and I see that my head is actually still 1BD7. What? Git just told me that I made a commit and everything was fine. So this is what actually happened. My shell is still pointing to 1BD7. Git made the commit 1774, but it just made it like into the ether. Like it's just floating around. So that's painful if you do it once. Imagine doing it several times and having all of your code literally floating around in outer space. You finish a feature, you push, push it up to GitHub, you're like, hey guys, I'm all done. QA pulls it down, they're like, None of this works. Of course, your response is, it works on my machine. Don't worry about it. You finally roll your eyes, you pull all your code down into a clean directory, and then you're like, oh, you're right. None of it works. Where is my code? So this is a terrible situation to find yourself in, and there is sort of a way out. You can recover um, by immediately checking out a branch as soon as you realize you've gotten yourself into this situation. So here I'm running git checkout, o2 git submodules. And then you can run the git ref log command. So this is keeping track locally of all the git commands that you've executed on your machine. And you can see those commits that are floating in outer space. So here's our 1774 new Gradle comments commit. And then we can do a cherry pick and apply that onto our branch, and we're good to go. So this isn't like a completely infallible solution because, you know, um, this is not an infinite log and you might just, you know, have a lot of different situations uh, where this might not work, but it is a good fail safe. All right, so removing submodules. So you're like, to heck with this. Submodules are too confusing. I want them out of my project forever, banished. How do you actually remove them? So you would think that just deleting the dependency sample library directory would be enough, but of course, this is git submodules. If you just delete that directory, they will come back to hunt you, and you will pull down code and see these little ghost directories floating around everywhere. What you really need to make sure is that you also delete the .git modules file that's telling your project all the submodules it's referencing, and you also need to delete the .git slash modules directory. All right, so if you want to use Git to manage your own private source code libraries, um, some pros are that versioning is brought to you by Git. Git is version control, so it actually like does versioning pretty well. You don't have to think about like, oh, what's the name of this library? What's the version update? You just reference a specific commit shaw and you're done with it. Versioning is specific and repeatable. You can be guaranteed that whenever you run this specific commit, from, or this branch from um, your shell repo, it's always going to point to the same exact location of, uh, the, in your library repo as well. One Android Studio project. This is awesome because you have all your code in one place. If you're making a lot of changes to your library internally at the same time as you're changing your shell, this will be really valuable. And again, you have access to the source code pretty simply. The major con is that magic is involved. So get submodules are kind of confusing, and um, once you get the flow, it's not too bad, but it is kind of a ramp up. So you have to get used to working with a detached head. You have to remember to pull down the latest submodule. I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a team where we've been banging our head against the wall because something's not working, and then we're like, oh, we checked out this branch, but we forgot to run get submodule update. That's why nothing's working. Um, you know, and then adding and tracking submodule references is tricky. 
And then while this was also a pro, it's also a con, your library versions are based on commit SHAs. So if it's not immediately apparent when you run git set module and get that commit SHA, what kind of features are included in that. All right, so moving on to the next Git-based solution is Google's repo tool. So this is kind of cool. This is actually what uh, Google uses to manage the Android source code. So here is sort of the uh, diagrammatic outline of what this will do. So you've got a new repo now called dependency parent. And this repo has one job, and it's to contain a manifest file that lists out all the dependencies of your project. So this manifest file will list out that it depends on dependency sample repo, and it also depends on dependency sample library. So notice that the directions of these arrows have changed, whereas Git submodules, we knew that dependency sample library was like the, the uh, parent that was depending down to the library. Here, our parent repo is just saying, pull all these things in. I don't really know like how they relate to each other, but just pull all of them in. So the way that I've set this up, when I pull all this code in, um, I still get everything in one Android Studio project. So you can see I've got my app module and my library module, and I've got access to all the source code. So these examples are in the 04 repo tool branch um, for the shell and the library, and then also um, I just it's just on master for the parent repo. All right, so how do you set it up? So first thing, you're going to want to create your dependency parent uh, main repo and put your manifest file in there. That's all it needs to be in there. So we'll take a look at the manifest file, which is called default.xml. So manifest is the wrapping tag. And then we've got three tags that we care about, remote, default, and project. So if we jump into the remote tag, um, you've got, you should just set the name, so that's the canonical name you're going to use to reference it. And then fetch is where the code's coming from. So this is pretty cool with this repo tool, is you can pull things from Bitbucket, Stash, and GitHub all into one project. You just have to define them as separate remotes. Then... Um, Default just says, if I don't specify this later on, what do you want to use? So I've defaulted my revision to use master, and I've defaulted my remote location to be GitHub. And then the project tag is where you list out all of your dependencies. So uh, this is just, uh, the name is just like the, the finishing of the URL to your remote. So mine, it's your user slash uh, repo name, typically. So Kio Kropovich is my username, and dependency sample is the name of the repo. We're pulling it from GitHub, which is the name of our remote up there. And then the revision is 04 repo tool. Like I said, that's the name of the branch. And then path, it, this is optional. I want to install this into the dependency sample folder path. Otherwise, it would default to putting it in the name path, which I don't want it to be in Kio Kropovich slash dependency sample. And then here we define the, another project, which is a dependency sample library. It's also pulling pulled from GitHub, and I want to put an independency sample library file path. So that's it. You would continue on defining all the projects that you depend on. So if you want to use this, first you're going to need to install the repo tool locally on your machine. It's really easy to do, and I have instructions at the end of my slides, so I'll post these later. Then you're going to go into a directory where you want to pull all your code down and you will execute the command repo init-u, and then the full URL of your parent repo. This will get you this, um, a hidden file dot repo, which is actually a folder that contains your information from your manifest. Then the key command is repo sync, and that's actually what's gonna pull all of your code down. After you execute that, then you'll end up with the sample and the sample library in your directory. So again, our code has now all been pulled down for us, but we need to add the, the code in Android Studio to, or Android source code. So again, settings.gradle at the repo level, or at the uh, shell repo level, will include my library, which is the name of my library. And I've done it a little bit different this way, to, this time to show you a different way that you could include it. Um, you could define it as a project directory, and then you define the file path um, here, and that way you just have a name, uh, my library, that you can reference in the build.gradle file. So then you just say compile project my library. Pretty straightforward. So when I go to the shell repo, dependency sample, and I run git status, I get a commit SHA. But I thought I told repo tool to pull down a 
branch name? Why is it giving me a commit number? Does this mean that repo tool is pulling down detached heads? Yes. So if you didn't like detached heads with git submodules, you'll like them even less with repo tool because that's all repo tool is pulling down. So now you also have to remember, not only on your library, but also on your shell, to always uh, check out a branch first before you make any changes. This could be more of a blessing than a curse, because then if you're just used to this as the workflow for every one of your repositories, maybe it's less likely that you'll mess it up. So a pro of using the uh, Google's repo tool is that versioning is what I like to call flexible version of Git. So hearkening back to those gem files I was such a fan of, you could just say pull the most recent version of master or of this branch. You don't have to set a specific commit SHA. And this is something that repo tool does for us. You give it a branch, it will pull the most recent commit from that branch, which is awesome. All of your versions are clearly defined in one place. So if you found yourself in a situation where you've got a shell that's referencing a library and that library is referencing a library and maybe even another level, um, it might be hard to know when you're pulling down the shell, like how many nested internal libraries are you pulling down? So you can see just everything that your whole project depends on in a single place and know where it's all coming from and what versions it's finding. Again, you've just got one Android Studio project that you have to worry about managing and you have in immediate code access. Um, I don't know if this is a con, but if you want to feel like a badass, you can be like, yeah, I use the cool, this cool tool that um, you know, Android Open Source also uses. Um, Cons, maybe this is overkill. I mean, if you just have one library that you're managing, like, this might just be adding an unnecessary layer in between you and Git. For example, the Android source code that uses this, their manifest file is over 500 lines long. Like, there's a ton of stuff that they have to manage, and if you're just doing one library, it might be a little silly. Um, not only do you now have to think about how Git is working with your code, you have to think about how repo is working with your code, and specifically, how repo is executing Git commands on your behalf. So you've just added another layer that you need to remember. You also now have more detached heads, and if you didn't like that part of submodules, you're not gonna like it here either. And even though this is the tool that Google uses for Android, um, again, it's not like Git, which is used for all platforms and all languages. Um, so you might find that there is less documentation or community than you wanted around this tool if you're confused by what it has done. And then a less repeatable build, because if you are relying on the most recent commit of a branch and that branch changes, now even though your manifest hasn't changed, now your, your CI builds are changing. So if that's important to you, um, you won't get that here. All right. So now I'm moving on to the Maven solution, Maven-based solutions. So first one we're going to talk about is Artifactory. So here's how Artifactory works. We have the dependency sample repo, our shell repo, and it points up to Artifactory, which lives in the cloud, and it says, I want this artifact, which is a library. And your dependency sample library sits over here, and it says, I will publish this artifact, and it hosts it up to Artifactory. So Artifactory is like this middleman that literally lives in the cloud, and this is what happens. So you've got the reference on one side, you've got the publishing on the other side. So you've added like sort of like this extra step now to keep your middleman in the loop. So all of these examples are on the O3 Artifactory branch. So here's the thing with the Maven-based solutions, as you know from pulling down libraries in your Gradle build, uh, third-party public libraries. Uh, once you pull it down, there's kind of like no source code in your uh, Android Studio project. You can certainly pull up the sources jar when you're stepping through, through things, um, if you've set that up. But you don't have immediate access to change both the shell and the library at the same time in one Android Studio project. So the first thing you're going to want to do is publish your library up to Artifactory. So we'll start off with the library piece. So if you take a look here, you can see I am in uh, the dependency sample library, and I've got the uh, My Library module there. So in the build.gradle of the project level of my uh, library project, I'm going to want to include the, that second class path line there, uh, the JFrog, build info extractor Gradle plugin. So uh, I should mention at this point that the uh, Artifactory and Jitpack both have free 
public hosting solutions, so you can try this out using the free version. Um, but if you want private solutions, they do cost. And uh, so just disclaimer that that is the case. And then at the build.gradle for your My Library project, you'll want to add a ton of stuff. So the first one is uh, you're going to add in the, the JFrog Artifactory plugin. So JFrog is the company that owns Artifactory. And then you'll also do the reg your regular Maven Publish plugin. And then you'll want to define your package name and all of the versioning at this level as well. So we've got two more tags, uh, tasks to talk about. There's the publishing task and then there's the Artifactory task you'll also have to add. So the publishing task goes through and lists out what you want to publish. So um, you, know, you can use Artifactory for stuff other than Android. So they have a whole list of types of um, files that you can publish. But for us, we're going to be publishing an AAR. We define the group ID version, artifact ID, and then finally we say, OK, prepare your, this project with this name, dash release.aar, because we're just assuming we're doing a release build um, in this canonical example. And then the Artifactory task ha has a, a publishing task. And you want to define the context URL as well. So the context URL is like where in the cloud is your stuff hosted. So uh, in my canonical example, I'm using the free version. And I'm hosting my artifacts um, on my local host on my computer. So again, at the end of the slides, I've got links for how you can set this up on your own. Um, but that's why it's pointing to local host. In the repository section, uh, you said the repo key, which sounds really intense, but it's just the file path that you want things to be published under. Uh, and then you would submit your authentication, which you can define in gradle.properties. So you don't have to check that in. <sighs> now, moving on to the defaults uh, task, then you just say, OK, I want you to publish the AAR. Um, I want you to really publish it, so set publish artifacts to true. Uh, and then uh, you set um, some properties to be attached to your artifact. So it's kind of like a lot of setup with Artifactory. Um, so once you've got everything set in your uh, library module, then you'll want to actually publish it. And you'll run this command, gradle assemble Artifactory publish. And this will compile your code and then push it up to the location for you. So if I jump into the uh, Artifactory uh, portal here on my local machine, I can see that my library 1.0.0.aar has been published, and it's in that repo key libs release local. Success. OK, so now I've got the library posted. Now we just need to reference it in our, our source code in our shell. So at the build.gradle of the project level of our shell repo, we're going to want to add in this Maven definition that says, look in the Maven repository at this URL, again, localhost, and credentials if you're doing an a authenticated version. And then in the build.gradle at your app level, you'll pull in the project. And this compile statement looks a little bit different from the regular publicly hosted um, Maven solution. So you'll need to define group, name, version, and extension all separately. And then when you build your shell project, you want to do dash dash refresh dependencies. So this will go out to Artifactory and pull down the latest version. So sometimes it's the case that you might have a version 1.0.0 that you're developing on internally, and you're not ready to bump the version number up, but somebody's made a change to that library. So Artifactory is not smart on your machine. It doesn't like go out and see if there's a diff between what's on your machine locally and what's posted. If you don't run refresh dependencies, it won't get anything new for you. And if you do run refresh dependencies, it will always get something new for you, even if there isn't any new code changes to get. So know that when you hit the big green play button on Android Studio, it's not running refresh dependencies for you. So if you want, you can put this as a command line option under uh, build compiler options in Android Studio so that it will always pull the latest version. I don't suggest doing this because you're going to slow your builds way down. And as we all know, like builds are slow enough already. There's no need to like, add extra time. So I would not do this. But if you're in a situation where you would like to, know that it's an option. What I usually do is I just hit play on Android Studio when I'm making incremental shell changes. And I know if I know that there's a library change coming, then I just go ahead and run a command line, Gradle build, refresh dependencies. So while Git submodules and detached heads might be kind of scary, Artifactory can sometimes seem like the Wild West. So there's a situation that I've called the publishing bandit. And I will show you how it can happen. 
So you pull your, your code down from GitHub, you make some changes and commits to the library code, you know, do a pull request merge, push it back up to GitHub, and then once all is said and done and everyone's happy with your code, you will publish from Artifactory. So this seems like a great workflow, except when you realize that uh, you don't really have to do any of that middle step. You can just pull code down, make changes, and then publish to Artifactory. Um, I've never known anyone to do this maliciously or on purpose, thank goodness. It happens all the time on accident because someone made changes to the library, they checked out a new branch, they thought they were awesome, they wanted to just test it out on, on like a, a sandbox or like what's called a snapshot publication, but they forgot to update the version number and then they just write over the official version on accident. So you can combat this by like putting some locks down and like only allowing your CI tool to publish to Artifactory, uh, but just know that like that's gonna be on you to set that up. This is not something that comes out of the box for Artifactory. All right, so summary of Artifactory. Uh, pros, you know, you've got versioning is now done by humans. So you define what major, minor, and patch numbers mean. You can put words in there. Um, it's up to you and you will know like I got version one and I know that these five features are part of version one. You also now get the benefits of having a compiled piece of code that you can just easily pull down and not have to worry about you know, pulling down the entire source code. Um, you can uh, highly automate this so that you know, if you do a release on GitHub or if you do a tag on GitHub, it will automatically go and create a new artifactory um, or ar artifact for you based on that versioning number. So you can set it up to be pretty cool, but again, that's kind of on you. This is my big thing. I'm a huge fan of Git, and as much as I've kind of trash talked them, I actually, Git submodules are my favorite thing. Um, but the versioning here has zero tied to Git. Unless you set something up where you're linking it with the tags when it gets published, um, you have no idea when you pull something down, like, what commit was this? And that's something that's always really frust frustrated me, is that, like, I get a version of a library that's in active development, and I have no idea, like, what branch this source code came from or what release. Out of the box, there's low security. People can overwrite accident libraries accidentally, which is pretty annoying. Um, and now you've got two Android Studio projects. If you're in a situation where you're actively developing features that require changes both in your internal library and in your shell code, it's going to be a huge pain to test these because you've got to write the code in the library, publish it, go over to your shell code, pull down the new library, and check it out. This is really annoying. And then again, stepping through code is harder. So you can set up your Artifactory to publish a sources jar, um, but again, it's not always um, clear if the sources jar you're stepping through matches with the artifact that you've pulled down. And now you've also got the extra step of publishing. All right, so the final and fourth solution that I'm gonna talk about is called Jitpack. Jitpack is also a Maven-based solution. So if you'll take a notice here, you can see that my arrows are no longer both pointing up to Jitpack. They're a little bit different. So your dependency sample writes out, uh, you know, I want to depend on this artifact from Jitpack. And it goes up to Jitpack. And in the cloud, Jitpack sees this artifact, which is it's really slick. It's actually depending. You give it um, information about your GitHub repo. Jitpack then turns around and goes to your GitHub, pulls the necessary code, builds it, creates the artifact for you, and then hosts the artifact to you. So you now no longer have to worry about manually publishing your artifacts. So again, it's a Maven solution, so you end up with just your app module in your uh, Android Studio project, or a separate Android Studio project that's just your library. My examples for this are going to be found on 05-jitpack. So how do you set this up? At the build.gradle project level, you're just going to include the URL for jitpack.io as a uh, Maven URL. Again, just a reminder that this example is using the public version, and it's relatively the same setup as a private version, except for you have to pay for it. And then the build.gradle at your app level for the shell repository you set your compile uh, definition as, for me, it would be com.github.yourusername, then colon the repo name you're using, and then colon the version that you want to use. 
So in our example, what that looks like is this. con.github.kiokrofovich, that's me. Dependency sample library, that's the name of our repo. And o2-git modules, uh, git submodules dash snapshot. So that first part, o2-git dash submodules, is the name of my branch. Dash snapshot is a cue to jitpack to say, pull the most recent commit from this branch. So you can see that this is pretty powerful, too, in the same way that get, uh, the Google repo tool allowed you to pull from multiple different, um, you know, hosting solutions. So I could pull code from source code or from uh, GitHub, from Stash, from Bitbucket, et cetera. So that version number, um, let me go back. That version uh, that was uh, o2 git submodules dash snapshot, you have a lot of power in what you, how you want to define your version. So you can define it as the tag name. You can define it as a just dash snapshot, which will just go to uh, your master branch and pull the latest for master. Branch dash snapshot, which will be the latest version of your branch. Or you could even do a la get submodules and refer to a short commit shot so you know for sure that you're just pulling from this specific location. So it's a Maven hosted solution, so it's similar in that when you want to pull down a new version of the library that has the same uh, uh, name, you'll want to run refresh dependencies. And that's it. So Jitpack is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, the pros versioning is human readable and it's managed by Git. I feel like this was kind of like the big balance that I was trying to find between these two, and it's both. Because you know what where you're getting stuff from, it's, it's human readable, you can reference a tag or a release number, but it's also based on Git, which is awesome. You've got the benefits of a jar or an AAR file, and you, now you don't even have to worry about publishing your own artifact. Jitpack is going to do all of that for you. So the cons, uh, on the other side, waiting for publishing. <laughs> if you're not doing publishing, someone else is doing publishing, and that would be Jitpack. So now when you are pulling down something for the first time, um, you're just going to have to wait for Jitpack to go out and pull it and build it and then give it to you. So obviously for my canonical example, this went really fast because I have like 50 lines of code in that whole library. But depending on how big your libraries are, this actually might be a terrible idea for you that every time that library is updated, you have to rebuild the entire thing on your own time. It might be better to use Artifactory where you can allow someone else to push that up in a pre-built format. Uh, here you have the potential for non-repeatable builds. Again, because you're referencing a branch, the most recent of a branch, uh, you might not know if you're getting, you know, what, you're, what kind of thing you're getting. Um, another thing is it's not, like, clear, like, uh, how Jitpack, to me, is handling this. So, you know, if you build it versus another person's building it, like, we're all getting artifacts that were, even though they're, like, the same reference, we're all getting separate artifacts because Jitpack is building and hosting real-time for you. So, uh, you know, things could go differently, and you might not easily be able to track down why. And then the cons, kind of, like, of the Maven-hosted solution, you've got two Android Studio projects, Stepping through code gets a little bit harder. So in summary, today we've talked about four different ways that you can library, manage libraries within your own team if you want a privately hosted solution. We've talked about uh, Git side of the house, which is uh, Git submodules and Google's repo tool. We've talked about the Maven side of the house, which would cost money if you wanted to use it, um, Artifactory and Jitpack. I think that I should also mention now that Artifactory and Jitpack have different types of pricing models, so that's also something that you should look into uh, for what makes sense for you. Artifactory is sort of more of like a blanket cost per their services. Um, I think it's like $98 a month or something like that. Um, Jitpack is, uh, you get all their services, but you just pay per repo. So I think it's like $9 a month for three repos and then so on and so forth. So those are the solutions that we talked about today. All of my code is at Keo Krofovich on GitHub. Uh, dependency sample, dependency sample library, and dependency parent are the three repos you'll look for. And uh, I'll post my slides after the, the talk is over, so you can also take a look at the branches uh, that I've referenced here. So also, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to tweet at me, at Kelly Schuster, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, and if anyone has any questions now, I would love to take them.
Yes. Oh, thank you. You had a question. Great. So the question is, what happens if you're working on a library that people are using like a pretty stable version, but you yourself are doing rapid development on the library and you want to test it quickly without having to wait to publish and such? So I wish that there was like a really cool answer, but what we figured out at my prior team is we just did this hack, which ended up being really popular. So we had a flag that was use artifact, and it was a bool, and we put it in our build.gradle file. So when we were doing rapid changes for the library that we needed to be testing quickly, uh, we just pulled down the source code and it sat in there similar to what it would have looked like with the GitSub modules or repo tool so that we could change the source code at the same time. And then when we were ready, then we could just publish from that same setup. We could just run the, the artifactory publish commands and then publish that up. Um, so I don't have that in here yet, but I'll do a new branch called like 6 dash hack um, so that because basically that was the only way that we did it because um, at my prior company we were using artifactory and it became just like this 10-step process every time we just wanted to change one thing you know and, and it was just it was really hard so I, I feel like that's like the best solution is to go into like source code mode where you have the shell and, and library together and then go back to artifactory mode for to reference the library later yes Um, so you're saying uh, that you still have a shell as a separate repo, and then you pull all your libraries from another repo, or everything's in one repo? Yeah, yeah. So definitely there is the option to do one repository that has multiple modules. Um, and the reason I didn't talk about that specifically is that for this talk, I was focusing on things that you could share around. So the, the downfall of having a single repo, even though you are allowed to break out into these like separate library modules via Android Studio, is that then if I wanted to share that code with another team at my company, um, it would be really hard to break that out specifically. I mean, I guess you could still pull down, you pull down the whole code, or you could publish, you know, Artifactory from, you know, that repo. You, I guess, yeah, you wouldn't have to use separate repositories to use a publish, a Maven publishing tool. Um, but it just seemed a little um, more separation of concerns to have separate repos. Great question. Anyone else? Yes. Have I tried Git subtree? I have not. Is it amazing? Is it mind blowing? Feels easier than submodules. Cool. And is it um, is Git subtree like a submodule command, or is it something that like rests on top of Git? Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I'll definitely take a look at it, and maybe we could chat a little bit after. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have not done it, but I know that it can be done. So in your Gradle file, you, you will just um, lay out. So the build.gradle file for your specific library module is what goes out and says, I want to publish this and this and this and this. And so when you run the Gradle command at your project level, it's going into the separate modules and publishing at that location. So I know that you can, I know that it can be done. So you could have like a repo that has like five libraries in it and publish five different artifacts if you wanted to. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming to my talk. And if you have any further questions, please tweet at me. I'll be posting the slides uh, within the next like 10 minutes or so. So thank you so much. Thank you.